Alright. Hi, I'm Lee. Uh, I'm going to be doing some album cover reviews. It's been a long time since I did these. I think I did Nightmare album by Vince Sevenfold when I was like 12. It's kind of shaky about getting in front of audiences and uh, put my little camera shot, I guess you would say that. Uh, now, COVID and everything going around, I need something to keep me occupied while I stay home. So I'm going to get back into album reviews. I don't know how many I'm going to do. Uh, but I'm going to try to do it a little different than the way everybody else does them. Uh, it seems like most people just kind of like talk about the album all together. Uh, I'm going to go track by track and uh, kind of play the track in the background and listen to that uh, while I'm talking about the actual song with each album. So Head of the King, first track is Shepherd of Fire. I don't know if you can hear it too well on the camera audio, but... Uh, Shepard Fox player right now. Um, this album came out back in 2013. For me, I was 12 years old when it came out, but uh, I had just discovered Avenged Sevenfold probably about a year before that. And uh, for me, um, Avenged Sevenfold kind of twisted everything for me, musical direction for my life. I'm 21 now. At the time, was probably about 10 years ago. Um, I actually didn't tell my dad with the Nightmare album. Uh, I wanted something for Chris for my birthday. Christmas. My birthday is like four days before Christmas. And I told him the only thing I want is the Nightmare CD. And he did that. Uh, but Hail of the King came out and I was already a fan, but I didn't I wasn't really like getting any new music from a Vince Sevenfold yet, so Hail of the King came out. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, I was at my grandma's house because we'd go over there every day, every day after school. And I saw that album came out, and uh, she was literally calling, calling from downstairs, dinner journey, all this and all that. And I stayed upstairs for probably like two hours, listened to the whole album. And uh, Shepherd of Fire, I mean, to just start out, you know, you got albums like City of Evil or the subtitle album, uh, and the Nightmare, of course. All badass albums. Handle the Cable was like just a completely different album. Shepherd of Fire, probably. I can't remember exactly how it felt when I first heard it, but I know uh, it's definitely been one of those that, you know, what I do hear, and it's like, that's my shit, you know, so, uh, Shepherd of Fire, great opening track, lyric-wise, story-wise, it seems like this whole album is kind of based on more of like a, a biblical inside, insight, which is kind of what Avenged Sevens was based on their whole career. Uh, their name actually comes from the book of Genesis in chapter 4, which is actually a song they have on the Wake of the Fallen album. Uh, I'm not sure if I can get to that one or a review, if I do a review of it or not, but uh, we'll see how this one does and we'll continue. So, uh, with Shepherd Fire, lyrically and just song wise, instrumentally, the whole song just kicks ass. Um, if you're an Avenged Shuffle fan, I'm sure this is one of your favorites. I'm sure this is one that. If it comes on when you press shuffle, you're probably not skipping it. Um, I know that's how it is for me. Uh, but this is easily probably the top three of their albums total. I'd say uh, you got to put Nightmare in there. That I, a personal favorite of mine is City of Evil. So sorry, self-titled album. But, you know, just to kick off an album like this, you know. So they wanted, I feel like they were going for more of like a Metallica Black album kind of vibe to it. Um... Like, they have, like, This Means War on this album, which we'll talk about later. And they, a lot of people were salty about it, and they, you know, wanted to kind of say it's a cover band, blah, blah, blah. Avenged Sevenfold always gets called a cover band. Everybody calls them, like, metal's best cover band. I'm just like, hey, you know, it's great musicians, it's great uh, songwriters lyrically. Uh, these guys know how to put a song together, so, you know, we're gonna, if I all I can really say on uh, Shepherd Fire, Pretty self-explanatory song. It doesn't really cut uh, cut too deep or anything like that. It just gives you that nice rock and kick-ass vibe, and then uh, you know, the chorus. It just it, it, they get into it. They put so Matt put so much effort in vocalizing. You got center strong guitar and Zachy uh, dual guitar, just like the whole song. And then uh, this is actually where they introduced a new drummer, Aaron Eli. Uh, I want to say he was in the band called Confide or something like that. I never really got into those guys, but. Uh, you know, he's just badass drummer. He was young. You know, he came in there and like you can hear it throughout the whole album, just like right here. Just a badass drummer. Uh, they ended up parting ways with him after this album uh, for creative reasons, but I mean, everybody says creative reasons and then it's like a completely different vibe. So we're gonna get into Hill of the King, the title track. 
just that opening riff. I mean, most people, um, you know, if they like Avenged Sevenfold, they don't love Avenged Sevenfold. You know, the ones that do, obviously, this is one of my favorite songs. But people that don't really listen to Avenged Sevenfold much, Head of the King is one of the songs they do really enjoy by them. And I mean, honestly, you just got an intro like that. And it's just crazy because this is the title track. You know, you put that on, uh, you know, you put that behind a song like Shepherd of Fire. So, you know, you make Shepherd of Fire like an awesome intro track to a great album. And then you got just a follow up, head banging, you know, groovy riff, you know, uh, to make your title track. Hit on the kick, you know, the chorus when they get to it. Um, uh, it looks, seems like a lot of reviews at the time when the album came out, people were trying to say Hail the King was like Joy of the World, the little Christmas uh, nursery. Uh, my first time hearing it, I didn't really think about it like that. And then when somebody said that, I think I was watching a review on it, and somebody said that, and uh, I was like, you know, that kind of actually makes some sense. Uh, but, you know, obviously, they're going for a catchy chorus. You know, so... I'm not gonna say that it is true that they got joy to the world from it. I think that's a little too cheesy. I wouldn't have really drawn lyrics from a, you know, a Christmas song. But uh, lyrically, this whole song, uh, it just like starts off. The first verse kind of kicks in there and here to here. Uh, it's just telling a story of war and just, uh, you know, who the, like defended the king. And, like I'll get back to like biblical aspects again. Uh, you know, I feel like the Head of the King album, when you put this song right here as like a title track, you know, you don't wanna, um, you know, you don't wanna like be too straightforward with it. So that's what I love about like heavy metal just music in general. You know, they'll have like hidden meanings that, you know, only like people that are a little bit more into like lyric writing. Like I'm a songwriter myself, so you know, I take a lot of inspiration from uh, lyrics like this. Um, you know, Head of the King chorus obviously is gonna bring people in. Just that open air riff with, you know, Sinister Gage starting to shred like that, you know, uh, brought a lot of people to the Fifth Seven forward, you know. Um, and that's why a lot of people, I think, were upset with uh, the follow up, which was the stage album. Because uh, Head of the King was like deep, so just one of their best album albums. And then uh, the stage comes out that a lot of people were kind of iffy about it. I, I personally like this stage. I feel like um, they should have, if they were going to approach that album like that, they should have, it seems like they might have been rushed to do it. Um, you know, the stage, I still still love that album, but it doesn't beat Head of the King. And the stage song itself, uh, the way it see, like I said, I feel like it was just too rushed to record. So if you put the title track of the stage up against Head of the King, the song, it's, it's uh, no bueno, you know what I mean? So, Hail of the King definitely is one of their best uh, title tracks. Um, of course, you got Nightmare, title track on that album. You're pro In my book, you're probably never going to beat that song for a title track. Uh, Hail of the King for its album definitely does bring a punch. Um, you know, so if you want to put Nightmare album versus Hail of the King, you got to put Nightmare the song versus Hail of the King the song, and it's like, uh... That's a, that's a conversation I'm not going to have because I don't even want to try to do that to my brain. Uh, this is my favorite band, so I'm trying to be a little bit biased and, uh, you know, some of this. But uh, simply put, I mean, that's just two records that you put against each other. It's an argument, you know. So uh, we're going to go ahead and skip to the next song. I'm trying not to make these videos too, too long. Uh, but I feel like that's all I really got to say about uh, the title track right there. So let's go to uh, Doing Television. All right, Dewey Time, they, uh, when they did uh, like interviews about this album, uh, I think they put out like a series of uh, like kind of like a behind the music talk on uh, each song. Uh, Dewey Time obviously gives you that good old uh, Guns N' Roses kind of vibe to it and Matt Shadows, they did admit that, that they were kind of going for a, uh, a Guns N' Roses kind of vibe, you know what I mean? So. They definitely pulled that off, you know, this definitely seems like something that, you know, a little too badass to be on, you know, like a lame Guns N' Roses album, but I would have thrown it on Appetite for Destruction and just had it, like, tear up some more charts, I guess, you know, that album just kicked ass, you know, uh, and, uh, for me, the song just kind of, it reminds me of, uh, Girl I Know, which is off of the Diamonds in the Rough album, like, lyric-wise, 
kind of talking about like uh, mistress or a harlot. Uh, not really prefer the beast of the harlot, but uh, you know, girl I know and do it how lyric wise. I feel like you know, I could I just put those two together as more of like a not not so much of a serious uh, lyric perspective, but more of like a uh, just gr just good storytelling of a uh, wild night or uh, just in anything like that, you know. So we're gonna go ahead and skip this one. Uh, short song, you know, it's catchy. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the way Matt sings it. For, I, I feel like he went a little bit too axle rolls with it, but it's still, you know, still a great song. I love the song, even with all that. It's super catchy. It's super fast paced. And it's. Uh, you know, Matt's still got his vocals. I think on this album, we're at its peak. So I'll go ahead and skip to the next one. This means war. So, like I was saying earlier, I mentioned something about it. Um, this means war. Everybody that I was trying to say that eventually some people were trying to take this album and make it Metallica's Black Album, but like in their version, I guess. Oh, um, that's not really a bad album to try to recreate. However, I really don't agree with that. Uh, I believe this album in its own is just a collection of it, of it stuff for just trying to get back a uh, more older sound of classic metal. Uh, just try to them try to like just basically push forward what they think, uh, kind of like a passing of a torch kind of thing. You know, basically saying like, okay, if you don't want to pass the torch, what's it gonna take? You know, for me, I feel like um, this album came out and it had like that '90s um, heaviness to it. You know, like, this one came out back when, like, Megadeth was released a countdown to extension in, and then, you know, Metallica do whatever they were doing, you know. Um, I feel like it could be up there with it. I feel like this out, like, if some phone in the 90s era, if they were coming out in the early 90s, would have been, like, a very, um, you know, contender-wise, you know, if they weren't got the same opportunities. We all know, uh, you know, Metallica and Megadeth came up in a different era, you know, it would have been done a completely different way. Um... So this means war. Honestly, it's a good song, but I've never looked at it as one of my favorites. You know, uh, my brother and a couple of my other friends, you know, they think this means war is like one of the best songs that this ever done. I'm like, yeah, it's a great song. Uh, for me, I just feel like it's a little too basic for me. Like, it's just not hard to say basic. I won't really say basic, but just it doesn't seem like it seems like more of an anthem type song. And I'm really not huge on songs that like kind of. Uh, it's hard. It's kind of hard for me to explain the way I feel about this song. I do still enjoy this song. Uh, however, if it does come on while I, when I press shuffle, I'm most likely gonna skip it to something else. Uh, I just feel like once I've heard the song so many times, I don't really need to hear it again. You know, if it comes every now and then, I get the mood where if I'm listening to one album at a time, you know, honestly, I'm not gonna skip it. Uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and skip to Rikerio, I think it's nice one, yeah. So, I really enjoyed uh, hearing them do like a, uh, more of an orchestra type, or whatever you would call the different language. I'm not, not too like in, into uh, singing like that or whatever language it is. I haven't done any research on it. I know uh, most people that do re reviews and stuff, they kind of research and stuff. I'm not going to do all that. I'm going to get in front of a camera and talk. And it's very good. But I do like this, the way they do it. They make it like a poem, and they turn the poem into an actual song. I love that. Uh, I feel like a lot of uh, my lyric writing comes from poetry. Like I, uh, I've always had the skill of writing, so um, just simple rhyming and simple, um, you know, keeping the syllables in check and just and then still coming through with like different waves of uh you know vocal patterns and stuff like that uh, but this song I, if i'm in the mood for it i'll you know i'll look it up and i'll listen to it you know like it ain't nothing um you know it, it does kind of fit the vibe of the album the whole vibe of the album kind of has that dark matter kind of subject to it um it's more of like an apocalyptic uh, theme album. It's how I feel in some ways, uh, listening to the whole thing, especially once we get towards the end with like Planets and Acid Rain. Uh, but Requiem, great song. Uh, obviously when they bring in the uh, other song, just for me, I think that's pretty badass. Um, but uh, 
Dude, this is, again, this is another one that I don't really like. Go to what else is up? Vegetable stuff for it's like that, like album filler. Uh, it's cool the way they did. It. I think it's very unique. I don't think they have another song that's anything like that. I think in some ways they kind of reminds me of a little piece of heaven with uh, more of like a twist on their normal kind of thing. So it's like kind of outlandish like that. Uh, but I give it that. So uh, with that being said, we'll go ahead and go to the next song too, which is Crimson Day. So, Avenged Sevenfold is a lot of times known for, uh, you know, they'll have like the softer ballad type songs. Uh, I feel like on this album, they didn't really get like a big hit off of one of those. I feel like on Hail Hail of the King, all their songs that, you know, were, were like breaking charts were like Shepherd of Fire, Hail of the King, This Means War. Uh, I don't think songs like Crimson, Crimson Day or, uh, you know, anything. I think it was a coming home. I don't think those songs really made like too big of a impact on the listeners. I know if I'm listening to it, it's relaxing, it's calming. Uh, for me, it's very heartfelt. I feel like uh, it's kind of like a love song, family-wise, and it's kind of like it's also showing the demise of the story. Um, like that's going along with the album. I feel like it does the same thing too. It kind of keeps up with that uh, post-apocalyptic. You know, storyline, Bible-wise, whatever you want to call it. Um, but again, it's just a, it's just a great solid rock song. It keeps like the same pace, brings in some heavier instruments. You know, it kind of shapes together once, uh, you know, once you listen to it, especially with the rest of the album. It kind of when you hear it all in a whole, it just really, it really sounds great. You know what I mean? It, it keeps up. You know, kind of gives you a little break from the heaviness of like this means war record but do a time it gives you a little break and starts to slow down oh um, and i mean I, you know i really do like the song and i feel like it, it is a go-to for me if i'm looking for something just to relax to so with that one we'll go ahead and skip this one let's see what we got next is heretic yikes <laughs> so heretic is literally Probably my favorite song on this album. Uh, like this song is just lyric-wise, instrument-wise, I love the song from top to bottom. Uh, it reminds me of something I've seen on Netflix. It's some show uh, one of us seen on there, but uh, this whole this whole song is just from beginning to end. I love. Chorus-wise, Matt kills it vocal-wise. Uh, just a heavy hitting, you know, song to say, you know, hey, you've condemned one of these men and they didn't, they're not in the wrong. You, you keep a, you know, you're keeping an honest man down. You know, you're killing, sending an honest, man, an honest man down to die, you're chaining him up. You got the wrong guy pretty much. You know, and then it kind of, you know, lyric wise, it kind of tells there's a reason that they picked that guy and that guy gets like chosen to do, um, basically just be like the feast of a fe festival of like flame, fire, balls, whatever you want to say, I don't know. But uh, like turning witches and saints to ashes, you know, and just, that goes back to like an older kind of uh, writer. Nobody in like the mainstream heavy metal or alternative metal, whatever you want to call this band, nobody really like writes like that anymore. You know, I feel like for me, you know, like I said, like, I write stuff like this all the time. You know, but I'm not gonna be able to touch Avenged Sevenfold's, you know, level. Obviously, I'm not, you know, that it's deep into it. You know, but uh, this is definitely one of my favorite songs by the band, and I definitely do listen to it a lot. Uh, I've tried doing some vocal covers of it, and uh, very hard to keep up with. But uh, you know, that just goes to show you how great Matt does vocal wise, and how. Uh, just you know how just how great of a song it is, you know. So we'll go ahead and get to the next one. I uh, won't we'll spend too much time on what you saw. That's like coming home, kind of like what I said with Crimson Day. Uh, both songs are great. Um, again, just them going trying to cool everything back down. You know, I feel like for me, I think personally, Crimson Day might I might like that one a little bit more to come at home. But each song has like its own. Like, these songs different in its own way. You know, they've both got, um, 
they've both got their own stories to them. They both play a good part in the album, and they're both kind of like some chill back songs to kind of give you a break from the heavy hitters. So we'll have to get to the next one. All right, Planets. Planets is probably the most uh, angry the band gets on, on this album. Uh, it kind of describes uh, Planets colliding. Uh, a lot of people try to say that, you know, it was Vince Huff when ripping off Crowbar. And, like, I'm from South Louisiana, and, like, I know Crowbar, and I know the song Planets Collide with Crowbar. But it's just, it's the same topic. You can't really say that a certain anybody owns that. You know, and I'm sure a bitch stuff will turn those who Crowbar is. So, I mean, I'm sure they're going to know that song. You know, but, like I said, you know, you want to go and you can make your own take on anything. That's the whole point of doing your own music. Because, you know, you have the freedom to write what you're writing. You know, you have, uh, especially if you have the ability, the talent like these guys, you're going to go out and make whatever music you want. You know, and Crowbar was huge back in, with the, back in the day, I'm sure. You know, it's still kind of big, you know, down here in Louisiana. You know, but a Fifth Seven Forward has kind of rock and launched up into the mainstream uh, metal scene. And uh, Crowbar, you know, they kind of, it's a lot of older bands kind of just uh, <clears throat> dying down now, you know, which sucks to see, but, you know, this is my favorite band. I still listen to all the old stuff. I still look like, you know, 21 years old, I listen to stuff probably back to the 40s, you know, so, and that's all kinds of music, mainly heavy metal and shit back to the 70s, 80s, uh, 90s and stuff, so. But Planets is uh, part of, uh, when they talked about, when a band talked about Planets and Acid Rain, on uh, one of those backstage things I was saying, I'm talking about uh, planets is like part one of a story, and acid rain is the part two. So part one of planets, you have the planets colliding, and um, you know the big collide and how scary it is, and there's a war that's going on, as what's told in the Bible. You know, just kind of how it's written, and then we go to acid rain. And Acid Rain was more of like the aftermath. Um, just, you know, just to end the album on uh, a really powerful song, you know. Uh, basically singing about, you know, Acid Rain washing away what's left, of, uh, what's left of humanity after the planets collide. And, uh, you know, so for me, I, I, there's not really much to get into with Acid Rain. Lyric wise, great song. Matt sings this song, fantastic. Um, I feel like it was definitely a great way to end the album. Uh, they definitely do have their own album endings, like they switch them up. Seems like with every album, you know, you're never gonna know if it's a heavy song or if it's a softer song or lyric wise, but I feel like they always try to end on the same note, and that's basically saying goodbye with each album. But uh, so that was my review of Fatal Decay. Uh, I'm gonna try to do some more. If you guys have any requests, if this even gets uh, out there enough for people to watch it, drop it in the comments. Please try to subscribe if you can, if you're interested. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.